Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. In the deep waters off the coast of Florida, grow magnificent natural formations up to 300 feet tall. These are the corals of the deep sea. Rich in biodiversity, they hold many secrets yet to be discovered. They're certainly an irreplaceable resource. But this marvelous and mysterious underwater kingdom is at risk threatened by destructive fishing practices that could destroy thousand-year-old coral mounds in one sudden swoop. So if you were to go and chop down a section of the redwood forest, people would see that. And unfortunately, with these reefs, they're in very deep water, and you just don't notice that happening. But with a 200-foot tall reef that's maybe a half a mile in diameter, you can imagine if you saw that on the horizon one day and it wasn't there the next, that would be pretty significant. Few humans have seen these deep sea reefs. Only very basic, often incomplete charts exist of the bottom of the ocean. There's an awful lot of area that's unexplored out there. It's really the planet's last great frontier. Better maps are needed to accurately determine the location of these fragile deep sea corals. It's more than just learning about what's on the bottom. It's really about what that means, in this case, to ocean conservation. Recently, experts from some of the country's premier ocean research institutions joined forces during a unique expedition. Using cutting edge technology, oceanographers explored the sea floor. We're seeing things that no man has ever seen before. And no matter who you are, that's exciting. What secrets lie beneath the waves? Will these new discoveries help save delicate coral reef ecosystems? It's a busy morning in Port at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute at Florida Atlantic University in Fort Pierce. On this day in late 2008, a group of experts from some of the country's top ocean research institutes are gearing up for a special research trip. Their goal is to map deep sea coral reefs off Florida's Atlantic coast. The mission is a collaboration between the Waite Institute for Discovery, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. This is fairly unique. Not only do we have three major institutions coming together, but it's the first time that a private philanthropic foundation like the Waite Institute has really gotten so directly involved in a major scientific expedition like this. The project called Catalyst One will utilize the latest ocean research technology to advance scientific knowledge of the Earth's final frontier. The Wade Institute was the driving force behind Catalyst One, and our role is to function as a catalyst to direct our resources towards bringing the best and the brightest together. The Wade Institute for Discovery is a nonprofit research organization created by former Gateway co-founder and chairman Ted Waite. It provides funding for research missions and owns cutting-edge equipment that aids experts in their work. The Catalyst program is built around autonomous underwater vehicles that allow us to go into the deep ocean and to cover a lot of ground very quickly and very efficiently. Autonomous underwater vehicles are devices that can record a variety of oceanographic data. 
Engineered by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, the Hydroid Rima 6000 models can dive as deep as 6,000 meters, or 3.7 miles, into the ocean depths. On this voyage, their job will be to create detailed sonar maps of the ocean floor. As soon as the research vessel reaches its first survey site, about 50 miles offshore from Cape Canaveral, Florida, it is time to put the vehicles to work. They carry as primary sensors, side scan sonar. They also have the option to carry either a camera, a multi-beam sonar, or a sub-bottom profiler. So they got a lot of capability to search the bottom of the ocean. At 6,000 meters, you can cover about 95% of the ocean. Hold on. An autonomous underwater vehicle, or AUV, is unique in that it is not tethered to the ship. It swims a mission that's programmed into it before it goes in the water. Big advantages of not being attached to a ship with a tether are the vehicle's much more stable. It can turn a lot faster so you don't waste survey time turning. You do not need to have a driver, so we, all we have to do is monitor the vehicle, and we do that acoustically. It sends us back status messages so we know how far away it is from us. Before a vehicle can be put in the water, Special transponders are deployed, which will communicate with the AUV acoustically. We put transponders on the bottom of the ocean, and then the vehicle, once it's down on the bottom, sends acoustic signals to those transponders. They respond, and, and the vehicle is able to determine its range from them and then its location. Once the transponders are in place, it is time to deploy one of the two AUVs. They have been nicknamed Mary Ann and Ginger, after two of the characters on the popular 1960s TV show, Gilligan's Island. Okay, we're going in. Using a specially built launch and recovery system, Mary Ann is the first vehicle to go on a dive. Yeah, bridge, this is the deck. Are we moving forward at approximately three knots? Yeah, it's very bad enough. I don't think it's a little more here. We use sonar extensively in the vehicle. We start with a side scan sonar. It looks out to the sides. It sends a sound pulse out of the vehicle that reflects off of objects on the bottom of the ocean. If something's sticking up off the seafloor, then we get a much stronger rebound of the sound, and that's recorded and mapped inside by the vehicle. The multi-beam sonar we use looks directly down, so if there were large objects under the vehicle, We'd swim over them and we'd get a return and it would tell us that there's a change in the bottom. The side scan sonar can cover an area of 750 meters, or roughly 2,460 feet on either side of the vehicle, making it possible to survey a large area in a single mission. We swim what we call a mowing the lawn pattern, in which we basically swim one row and then turn around and come back and swim in a row adjacent to that. And with this vehicle, we hope to be able to cover in one day over 25 square miles. Different Remus models have been used for a wide range of operations, from locating submerged mines during Operation Iraqi Freedom to finding leaks in a New York water supply tunnel. Okay, 79 West, .58441. Vehicle operators program a set mission into the AUV before its launch. During its dive, they monitored the vehicle's progress from the ship. Just in the midst of our first mission, um, and it's, a, it's a first look at an area of interest. Um, it's about a five-hour mission the vehicle has been on. Um, what you can see here, if you look on the screen, uh, right now it's underwater, so we're getting very limited data. You can see it's you know a very square grid going up and down, back and forth. And then every two minutes, we've been getting an update of the vehicle's position. And so that's lit up in blue, in these little blue dots that are going along here, um, sort of laying the cookie crumbs as it goes through the forest. It stayed along its track lines quite well, uh, made the turns tightly, uh, despite a uh, formidable current and right now it's coming up towards the end of its last northern leg and it will swim to the surface once it gets there. Bridge lab. Yeah George we just want to confirm you got generators in line we can fire up the HPU back here. All right copy thanks. Once the mission is complete the Remus returns to the surface. 
it dropped its ascent weight uh, and it came up from about 360 meters in about five minutes. When the vehicle popped up, we were close enough, so it came right up on the Wi-Fi. And it also made a uh, satellite phone call to us, which it will do when it comes back up to the surface after it uh, gets a GPS fix. If it's out of range of Wi-Fi, then that, uh, that phone call is what tells us where it is and where the ship has to drive to, uh, to pick up the vehicle. Three, two, one, fire! We'll pull this guy up on deck, we'll plug it in, uh, download the data, that'll take about half an hour. Based on that, program a new mission, back in the water. And I know it's on that bridge. Lead scientist on the cruise, John Reed, is excited to see what the AUV may have discovered. John has studied the deep sea corals off Florida's coast for over 30 years, and he's been actively involved in trying to protect these magnificent features from destructive fishing practices. We're just beginning to understand about the ecology, but we do know that deep water reefs provide habitat for probably hundreds, if not thousands, of species of little organisms that live within the coral, as well as the sponges and gorgonians. And those are providing food for the smaller fish. So there are a number of species that would only occur in the deep water reefs, and certain species of fish use those deep water reefs for their spawning aggregations. Most people, when thinking of coral reefs, picture colorful oases in shallow tropical waters. But many of Earth's coral reefs are found in the cold, deep, dark depths of the ocean. And while deep water reefs function similarly to their famous shallow water cousins, there are some distinct differences that make them unique. It's very similar as far as biodiversity and ecology, but they're different because they lack the algae that shallow water corals have. So deep water corals are pure white and there's no light for algae to grow. So they have to take all of their food from plankton falling out of the water column. So they have to capture all of their food, whereas shallow water corals have this algae in their tissues, which actually helps provide food and oxygen to the shallow water coral. Over the course of his career, John has primarily studied two species of deep sea corals. One is Oculina varicosa, commonly known as the ivory tree coral. So far, it is only known to occur off Florida's east coast at depths of up to 300 feet deep. The other species is Lophelia pertusa, which grows at depths of up to 3,000 feet. It can be found in all oceans except for the polar regions. Over the years, scientists at Harbor Branch have discovered over 300 potential deep sea reefs along the coast between Jacksonville and South Florida. 60 of these have been documented or ground truthed with a manned submersible. Scientists now have reason to believe that the deep reefs off Florida's coast may exceed the area of all shallow water reefs in the United States combined. John has done most of his deep sea coral research with Harbor Branch's man submersible, which has allowed him to identify living corals and collect samples for research. Use of the AUV on this trip makes it possible to survey large sections of the ocean floor. Currently, few detailed bathymetric maps exist of the deep waters off Florida's coast. Such charts are needed not only to aid scientists in ongoing research, but also to document reef locations so that they can be protected. A small golden crab fishery using crab pots can damage the reefs, as can potential oil exploration. But by far, 
the biggest threat to these deep sea corals is bottom trawling for shrimp. In the process, a giant net is dragged across the ocean floor, capturing everything in its path. You can imagine these reefs sort of like delicate porcelain bushes, if you will. And uh, if you were to take a bulldozer through a china shop, that's sort of the equivalent of what's happening on these reefs. John has seen firsthand the destruction bottom trawling can cause to reefs. He began his career studying Florida's Oculina banks in the 1970s. During the early years, his submersible dives would take him to spectacular reefs teeming with life. But only a few years later, hundreds of acres of once spectacular coral mounds had been turned into rubble. Today, only 20 acres of intact Oculina reef tract remain. Concerned about the coral's future, John and his colleagues presented their findings to the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, seeking the reef's protection. Eventually, their hard work paid off. In 1984, they enacted the Oculina Protected Area, which was the first marine protected area in the world to protect the deepwater coral. The Oculina Protected Area is 300 square miles. Since 2004, John and scientists from other institutions have gathered data documenting the Lophelia reefs between North Carolina and the Straits of Florida. This information was provided to the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council in hopes that regulations will be put in place to protect these reefs as well. The South Atlantic Fishery Management Council in order to protect these reefs um, has proposed to make these a marine protected area, what they call a HAPC or Habitat Area of Particular Concern. The proposal is to protect all of the known reefs from North Carolina to the Florida Keys, which would cover an area of 23,000 square miles. So it's a huge area and it's primarily to protect it from potential destructive fishing methods. So these maps that we're making this week will help to determine exactly where the reefs are and where they're not. So we can leave areas where there's no reef open for fishing and, and protect the areas where we know there's reefs based on the side scan sonar as well as the previous work I've done out here. We want to strike a, a good balance between making sure that fishermen don't lose their livelihoods, that they have good areas to fish, but at the same time, they're not destroying reefs in the process. Most of the commercial fishermen, you know, understand how that coral is providing habitat for the fish and the crabs that live out here. So if we destroy the habitat, we're going to destroy the fishery in the long run. So it's protecting ourselves. Deepwater reefs around the world are being destroyed at an alarming rate. We could lose species that we don't even know that are there that could be the cure for AIDS down the road or cancer. Every time we come out here in the Florida Straits with our submersible, we find new species and quite often new sponges or whatever that have new chemical compounds that we never discovered before. You know, it's going to be beneficial to mankind uh, not to destroy the habitat. You're going to kill, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years of growth for a very short-term gain. So there's one. Once the data from the AUV has been downloaded, the team of sonar analysts gets to work, processing and analyzing the large data sets the vehicle has collected on its dive. That's cool. That's great. Now this, whole, this mound, we knew this was here, we knew that was there, we had no idea this was here. Hmm. Well, this is the side scan sonar data and essentially shows you, it's like you're looking down on top of a mountain peak and we found that they're about 
1,800 meters east to west. So each mound is maybe, what, 500 meters in diameter, mm -hmm. something like that. During a first scan of a region, the goal is to cover as large an area as possible to get an idea of the bottom features. Then, on a follow-up dive, operators can program the AUV to return to areas of interest to collect higher resolution data. What we're going to do on this second dive is, is, is try to get you in a better depth. So we'll see the actual topography. It's probably best for Can you make the AUV a, to go north the, south. Well, yeah, north south. Most interesting part of the reef will be from the peak to the south. So that's where the live coral is. So I want to see that face the best. Once John and his team have decided what seafloor features they want to examine more closely, Mary Ann is reprogrammed and sent on her second mission. Still looking good. John and the crew are energized to have discovered one previously unknown reef on the first dive. This research mission has been over a year in the making, and it is exciting to see the hard work pay off. Well, this is a major undertaking, so um, to bring this kind of technology together and all the personnel and everything, all the expedition logistics, I mean, you're talking millions of dollars. Each of the Rima 6,000 AUVs alone come at a price tag of close to $2 million. But given the huge data sets they can collect in a relatively short period of time, they are actually a very cost-effective way of doing research. Aside from the three major partners in this expedition, additional scientists from the University of Miami and the National Undersea Research Center are also along on the trip to share their expertise as the team covers unchartered territory. Nice. Perfect. Grab it. After a few hours, Mary Ann returns with high-resolution data of the three coral mounds that showed up on the sonar scan from the previous dive. Based on observations John has made on one of the three reefs during a submersible dive in the past, he is able to make assumptions about the depth and bottom type of the other two mounds. I would imagine uh, we have not been on the second reef yet, but because of the height and the similar topography as this reef, I would bet all of that red is living coral up there. We're gonna take the, uh, the black and white side scan maps, which gives you an indication of how hard the bottom is. You know, you can tell hard bottom from soft bottom, maybe coral rubble from higher relief. So now we can take this map we know what that is, and now we can extrapolate it within this whole 25 square mile area and estimate the percent of the bottom that has living reef versus muddy bottom. And that'll help the agencies like NOAA Fisheries, South Atlantic Fishery Council to determine the boundaries of these protected areas. To further enhance the data, University of Miami PhD student Giago Coher plans to run it through special software called Flatermouse that can create animated 3D images. He has used it in the past to create maps of deep water reefs found between Miami and the Bahamas. Once those guys, they give me the, the files, I can uh, put into the Flader mouse, I create this shade relief topography and then using a, a special joystick like you have in the video games, we can make those fly through going very close to the surface, the same thing that you're seeing here. So I hope I can do that with the data that you're collecting this week. So the swaths would have to be at one sixty again. We have to break out the that, side bottom profile. You know, that's weird. because yeah, okay. <laughs> Throughout the mission, the AUVs and sonar crews worked around the clock. They braved rough seas, and the AUVs managed to safely maneuver over high relief bottoms greater than 200 feet tall. After 10 AUV dives and seven days at sea, an exhausted but exhilarated and energized crew returns to shore, having created maps of dozens of reefs, including several that were previously unknown. 
this is the first time any of this has been seen in, in, in a resolution like this. And so, you know, anything could come along here. The stuff that John's looking for, you might run across a Spanish galleon or you might, you, you could find anything out here. And, and uh, it's kind of exciting from that end. Uh -huh. Looks like you hit the mother load. That's oh, oral. That's it's pretty much everywhere. That is wild. Yeah, yeah. that's a big feature. Oh, it's, the mission's been going fantastically. We've been getting excellent data, so it's, it's very exciting. Much data on deep sea reefs has been collected on this mission and others before it. Now it is up to the regulators to decide whether or not to protect these fragile coral reefs for future generations before it is too late. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources.